we are live now good morning so should we start yes yes we are live good morning uh, respected faculty and uh, dear delegates uh, today we are having the fourth session it will be on megaloblastic anemia the session will be taken by dr pooja diwan she is professor of pediatrics and in charge of pediatric hematology oncology division at university college of medical sciences and guru tegh bahadur hospital uh, she is a awardee of royal college of uh, pediatrics and child health uh, visiting fellowship on 2014 and she is also a fellow of indian academy of pediatrics in 2015 she has received various awards like sala vaishna award dr james flett endowment award dr v, v balagopal raju award ss manchanda award in 2015 she was also uh, she is also associate editor of indian pediatrics since 2014 and she is editor in chief of uh, ucms journal of medical sciences she has authored many books and chapters and uh, she has more than 120 index journal publications we welcome dr pooja diwan ma'am and uh, i request dr pooja diwan ma'am to please uh, start sharing your screen so i do that good morning to all the participants and all the attendees so i'll be sharing my screen now then please go through the advanced feature yeah i request all the delegates please post your queries in the question and answer box so uh, today we'll be dealing with megaloblastic anemia uh, primarily the diagnosis and the management part which we face as clinicians when we are in the opd so this is a very important and common um, anemia that we see in practice and uh, i'll go through all the steps that you need to pass through make to make a proper diagnosis so um, megaloblastic anemia is actually a type of anemia which is characterized by the presence of megaloblasts in bone marrow and macrocytes in blood now i want to emphasize here that the diagnosis is basically a diagnosis of bone marrow aspiration so unless you have done a bone marrow aspiration and you are able to prove megaloblastis the presence of megaloblasts in the bone marrow you should not use the word megaloblastic anemia you may preferably use macrocytic anemia if you have made a diagnosis based on your peripheral smear so uh, we'll come to why it is thought so the main reason being that pathologists feel that since there are so many uh, differentials which need to be excluded when megaloblasts are there in bone marrow so they make the diagnosis only based on bone marrow aspiration however it does not mean that we need to perform a bone marrow aspiration in all cases most of the times we we'll not be doing a bone marrow aspiration and we'll come to the intricacies later on now i would like to point out that the most common etiology for macrocytic anemia is nutritional predominantly the dietary deficiency of vitamin b12 and folic acid which is seen in more than 95% of such cases now what are megaloblasts the ones that we were just talking about these are actually large cells which have a asynchrony between the nucleus and the cytoplasmic maturity consequently these cells are large they have a very large nucleus where the chromatin is not condensed but in, in fact is dispersed and it appears seed like the cytoplasm is normal in maturation so just to show you the basics okay uh, first we'll be dealing with the pathogenesis and then i'll be showing you the slide so why does this happen the, uh, the asynchrony between the nucleus and the cytoplasm we know that uh, cobalamin which is your vitamin b12 gets um, Uh, once it is uh, there in the body it needs to be activated into two forms it's either a methyl cobalamin or an ad adenosyl cobalamin now both these uh, uh, vitamins which are the activated forms play a role in the dna maturation as well as the cytoplasm maturation so let's see how so in the uh, cell in the cytosol there is the enzyme methionin synthase now methyl cobalamin acts as a cofactor and it converts homocysteine into methionine this methionin has a role in myelin synthesis so if you don't have methyl cobalamin or there is a deficiency of vitamin b12 in the body this conversion will not occur therefore homocysteine will accumulate in the body 
and myelin form formation will be disrupted. Now, during this process, there is also the con uh, conversion of methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is acting as the methyl donor for this activation process, and it gets converted into tetrahydrofolate. Mm -hmm. This tetrahydrofolate is involved in DNA synthesis. Now, since DNA synthesis is not occurring because this process is not happening, because of that, your DNA uh, is not synthesized, the nucleus remains immature, and we see stages with immature nucleus in your bone marrow. Now, so this the you can see that this explains why we see neurological findings in B12 deficiency, and it also explains the nuclear uh, immaturity that you see in the peripheral smear and the bone marrow. Now, in the mitochondria, also the vitamin B12 has a role to play. And you can see that when propionyl CoA gets converted to methyl manolyl, this methyl manolyl CoA gets converted into succinyl CoA. Succinyl CoA itself has a role in several uh, processes in the body. You know, it is a part of the citric acid cycle. It has a role in the hemoglobin synthesis. So whenever this enzyme is not able to act because of adenosyl cobalamin being deficient in the body, uh, the, there is a disruption of the Krebs cycle. There is a disruption of the uh, myelin synthesis and also several cytosolic processes are disrupted. The ATP is not synthesized. Consequently, a lot of changes in the body occur. So uh, again, as a result of this, methyl malonyl CoA gets accumulated, propionyl CoA gets accumulated, and these in fact act as functional markers of B12 deficiency. So this is why these changes that we will uh, see in megaloblastic anemia get it happen. So um, this is another slide which is showing how uh, DNA synthesis occurs. So as I told you, that methyl tetrahydrofolate, which acts as a donor for activation of cobalamin gets converted into tetrahydrofolate, which gets converted into methyl tetrahydrofolate, methylene tetrahydrofolate and further gets converted into DNA. So coming to the basics again, uh, the when the uh, red cells are formed in the bone marrow, you can see that initially you have these large cells which are blue. These are your colony forming units which are the erythroid precursors, they get converted as the uh, nucleus matures and the RBCs are being formed. You can see this nucleus gets condensed and this gets darker and smaller. And ultimately, you can also see that the cytoplasm, which was initially blue, becomes a little pinkish. So these are the uh, reticulocyte stages when uh, the cytoplasm is pink, it is hemoglobinized, but the nucleus is disappearing. So that is why the mature RBCs do not have a nucleus. In contrast, when there is a megaloblastic erythropoiesis, the stages remain the same, but the nuclear maturity is lacking. So you see that these large cells are a, a large, the cells with the large nucleus are appearing till later. This seed-like appearance is remaining. And a lot of times you can even find these cells in the bone marrow. There is a spillover sometimes. So this is how a megaloblast would look. You can see the sieve-like nucleus. This is how these appear in your bone marrow. Now coming to why this problem is important. Now uh, B12 deficiency as per the uh, CNNS survey um, is a, a, we found that we can see that B12 deficiency is particularly, when we see the pediatric age group, you can see that as the children become older and approach adolescence, the prevalence of B12 deficiency becomes to the tune of one third. So 31% of your children aged 10 to 19 years are having B12 deficiency. And uh, you can also see when we look at the under five group, that in the younger kids, although we do not have data of infants, but we know from our practice and from the studies which are available, although we don't have a survey, that B12 deficiency is particularly common even in infants. That is because the infants get their B12 from their mothers. And if the mothers are lacking, then the infants are likely to be deficient in B12, in vitamin B12. So you can see 23% of children aged 12 to 17 months are having vitamin B12 deficiency. 
If you look at the prevalence of folate deficiency, then again, you notice that the prevalence is higher in the adolescent age group to the tune of 36.7%. And again, when we look at the under five age group, uh, we notice that um, it's more or less same. So there's not much variation in the prevalence. But yes, we can, from these two slides, we know that whenever older children are coming to you with anemia, you have to think of B12 and folic acid deficiency. And when you have younger children, then uh, infants, then again, you have to think of B12 deficiency. But most of the under five children have iron deficiency anemia. It is not uncommon, however, to have a coexistent deficiency. Now, talking of the etiology of macrocytic anemia, this is where I wanted to tell you that why we use the term megaloblastic when we have a bone marrow uh, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Because some mm -hmm. of the conditions, although associated with uh, macrocytic anemia, may not have the presence of megaloblasts. So this includes chronic liver disease, myelodysplasia, which may have um, these plastic changes, and the peripheral smear will have macrocytes. Then again, hypothyroidism. Most of uh, conditions like liver disease and hypothyroidism lead to uh, macrocytes because there's a disruption in the RBC membrane syn synthesis. So the cells are larger, but there is no disruption in the nucleus per se. Alcohol abuse is not a common cause, is not a cause seen in children, and this is more uh, relevant to adults. Sometimes it has also been noticed that uh, patients with chronic liver disease do have dietary deficiencies and malabsorption. They may have storage difficulties of B12, and therefore these patients could also have more than one mechanism of uh, macrocytic anemia. So they could be having some amount of megaloblastic maturation as well, but predominant mechanism remains abnormality in the synthesis of the cell membrane, RBC cell membrane. Now coming to the etiology, as I told you that the dietary deficiency is the most common cause. So uh, we know that the recommended daily allowance for vitamin B12 is around one to two micrograms per day. And the deficiency is more prominent in patients, in uh, children who are um, ha having a vegetarian diet compared to uh, those who are non-vegetarian. So the uh, deficiency is more common in vegetarians. And uh, this actually means the level of B12, not the deficiency. So deficiency is more common in uh, patients who are uh, vegetarians and vegans rather than those who are non-vegetarians or over-vegetarians. This is because the uh, source of vitamin B12 is mostly animal uh, sources, which include meat, liver, poultry, eggs, milk products, and um, some vegetables like spinach, beetroot, mushrooms, and apples, and fermented food items are also good sources of vitamin B12. In contrast, uh, folic acid um, is more common if the, uh, again, the sources are um, mainly in um, dark green leafy vegetables, and asparagus, beans. So you can see that all the greens which are there in the diet are good sources of folic acid. And we know that the RDA of folic acid is around 400 micrograms. And in infants, it is little lesser. So 150 to 200 micrograms. And as the age increases, the RDA increases. In certain conditions like prematurity, growing children, that is adolescence, when there is a growth spurt, if patients have hemolytic anemias, there is a dyserythropoiesis, patients are malnourished, there are chronic infections like HIV or hepatitis, overcooking of food items, uh, children on predominantly goat's milk, and women who are pregnant and lactating. These all have increased requirements of folic acid, hence they are prone to deficiency. The other mechanism of uh, deficiency, could, if you don't have in diet, they could be still, uh, the diet is adequate, but still the patient could be having deficiency. For B12 deficiency, if there is an impaired absorption, we know that vitamin B12 is absorbed in the ileum. So an intrinsic factor, which is secreted by the parietal cells, if it is not there, then there is a impaired absorption of B12. So this impairment can be due to either a congenital defect when the intrinsic factor is not produced, or there is a pernicious anemia or where there are antibodies against, autoantibodies against intrinsic factor, 
or the patient has a chronic gastritis associated with achlorhydria, where uh, there is uh, impaired dissociation of food-bound um, vitamin B12, which affects its absorption. And in patients who have undergone surgical procedures or corrosive injections, then again, your ileum can be affected and the surgeon may have resected a part or the mucosa um, may have been atrophied. The impairment can be there in the absorption. There are certain conditions like Crohn's disease, um, celiac disease, pancreatic in insufficiency, tuberculosis of the ileum, bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel, fish tapeworm disease, which is not so common in India, but is more common in the West, long-standing uh, proton pump inhibitor intake, these could all interfere with the absorption of, lead to malabsorption of vitamin B12. In contrast, we see that here it is the ileum, but in folic acid, the absorption is predominantly in the duodenum and jejunum. So conditions associate, associated with uh, uh, tropical sprue or gastrectomy or diverticulosis of the small intestine, a malabsorption could again affect your folic acid um, levels in the body. Intake of certain drugs like phenytoin and phenobarbitone, which we use commonly in our practice, can also lead to a folate deficiency. Sometimes you can have uh, transport defects in the body for B12. So we know that when B12 circulates in the body, there's a transcobalamin 2. Um, to which it gets bound. And if there is an impairment in this uh, process, then again, you can have a B12 deficiency in the body. Some patients with congenital uh, or inborn errors of metabolism where B12 uh, is affected include, you can have a defect in the activation of B12 to um, methylation of your cobalamin, or you could have a defect in the, uh, again, conversion of cobalamin to adenosyl form. Sometimes you can have a combined deficiency of both the conditions and certain uh, diseases like methylmalonic acidemia or thymine responsive megaloblastic anemia, which you suspect when the patient, especially in diabetic children who present with sensory neural deafness, you should suspect megaloblastic anemia if due to B12 deficiency if you find macrocytes in the peripheral smear. Likewise, homocystinuria, although it is of three types, we know that type 1 and type 2 are associated with megaloblastic anemia. And here you can suspect your patient to be having these conditions based on eye findings, like if you have subluxation of the lens or the patient is having developmental delay, sometimes they present with stroke-like illnesses. And uh, these, obviously, the IEM should be suspected in any child who has a developmental delay. Uh, presents early onset, has certain uh, features like they are prone to have light hair and very fair skin. So you have certain features in the physical examination which can sometimes give you a clue that uh, this child may have an inborn error of metabolism leading to megaloblastic anemia. This needs specific workup and specific management which we cannot cover in this session completely. So this is just to give you a broad, broad overview. Sometimes you can have acquired metabolism defects also of B12. This includes uh, due to drugs, due to liver disease, and malnutrition. Likewise, in case of folic acid, you can have uh, metabolic disorders in the form of DHFR, that is dihydrofolate uh, reductase deficiency, or methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency. Again, homocystinuria also predisposes to folate deficiency, and you could have drug-induced folic acid def uh, deficiency, which we commonly see in patients who are receiving methotrexate, uh, sepcran, pyrimethamine, and uh, of course, alcoholism is not in children, but liver disease, yes, again, it can lead to deficiency of both B12 and uh, folic acid. Now, coming to the clinical uh, features, when to suspect so um, uh, B12 and folic acid deficiency has an insidious onset in children. The patients will present with pallor. There could be some amount of icterus, which appears due to ineffective erythropoiesis and some amount of hemolysis that occurs in association. The patients would be lethargic. They could have fatigability and anorexia, glossitis, mouth changes, uh, stomatitis, chelitis, 
and sometimes even pain in the tongue can because of soreness. We commonly say a beefy red tongue is seen in uh, B12 deficiency. Uh, if the cause of B12 deficiency is an underlying uh, malabsorption, then the patient could also present with diarrhea. There could be hyperpigmentation of extremities and which predominantly involves the knuckles, which is apparent in children. And sometimes if the patient has severe hematological manifestations of B12 deficiency, they could present with bleeding and thrombosis. Oh, sorry, this is, uh, I think this is, in this mode, it is not coming like an uh, animation. Dr. Ajay, I would like to remove this uh, or I'll just uh, go on with the slide. So uh, neurological features of B12 deficiency are uh, particularly uh, uh, seen in uh, cases where, uh, especially in infants, and these children would present with a developmental delay, development regression of milestones. Uh, sometimes you could have hyperreflexia, and later on it could either lead, it could even lead to loss of reflexes. And uh, a common uh, clinical spectrum with which B12 deficiency kids present in infancy is your infantile tremor syndrome. We'll come to that later, but we know that these are mostly bre breastfed babies whose mothers are lacking in B12, and they present with uh, developmental delay and tremors, coarse tremors, which are more marked in your proximal lens. In older children, uh, the, uh, the involvement of your uh, posterior columns and the lateral tracts can lead to presentation in the form of loss of position and vibration sense. It could be a peripheral neuropathy and presence of paresthesias. And um, sometimes these patients in very, very uh, severe cases can even present with uh, spastic paresis with uh, brisk reflexes. And later on, it could even lead to hypotonia and areflexia. The uh, Babinski reflex would remain extensive in such cases. However, it has been seen that uh, there is a mismatch between your uh, CNS manifestations and the hematological manifestations. And the severity of neurological manifestations does not always correspond to the degree of anemia. And often these patients may have a normal MCV, so it is important to suspect an underlying B12 deficiency, even if you don't have these abnormal uh, findings on your peripheral smear or your CBC. So uh, this is how the tongue would appear that we see the beefy red tongue. And this is how you see the hyperpigmented knuckles. The hyperpigmentation of knuckles occurs because again, um, the reduced glutathione is there in the body. This uh, is reduced because of the methyl uh, B12 uh, that is there in your body. And this glutathione inhibits the conversion of uh, tyrosine to melanin. So in the absence of um, vitamin B12, this inhibition does not occur. So the tyrosine gets converted to more aggressively to melanin. Therefore, it leads to hyperpigmentation. I'm unable to play my video Dr. Ajay or uh, the admin, can you help me? Uh, this video is not playing. Yes. Ma'am, uh, I think I'll try to start here from my side. Just a moment. Should I, should I stop the share then? Just a moment. Let me try. Uh, please stop sharing. I'll share my screen. Yeah, I'll do that. I think it's already stopped sharing from my side. Is it still showing? Just no, no, no. Your screen has stopped sharing. Is it visible, ma'am? Yeah, I can see. So as you can see here, you can notice um, 
these subtle movements in the hands and the hyperpigmentation of the knuckles is visible in the left hand if you see and th this child had presented at 11 months of age with developmental delay you can see the appearance is quite chubby there are sparse thin hair and you can notice these tremulous movements so sometimes the findings can be very subtle and you have to suspect and get the patient tested. And in such cases, it is also important to test the mother. Can we move to the next video, sir? The next slide. Now look at this. So here you can see that the movements are much more marked. So they are frank, gross movements at the proximal. These are the wing beating tremors that we talk of in infantile tremor syndrome. And uh, these movements are uh, sometimes very difficult to control and may even require the use of other drugs other than B12 supplementation. So we often use propanol or phenobarbitone or phenytoin. Sometimes even carbamazepine has been used to control these abnormal movements. So uh, in all such cases, this is the spectrum of infantile tremor syndrome. And in all such cases, you need to um, assess both the mother and the baby. So Can you uh, please coming... Can your screen now? I'll stop sharing. Right. Yeah. So uh, proceeding with the laboratory workup, whenever you suspect based on clinical finding, the uh, first most important test is your CBC with the indices. So uh, there would be anemia, you would have macrocytosis. So the MCV would be increased. In uh, around 5 to 10% of cases, you could also have associated leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. That is, the patient may present with pancytopenia. So the CBC is the foremost test, but you must remember that MCV should not be used as the only parameter because like I told you that sometimes there's cases with neurological impairments do not have a raised MCV. So both your clinical acumen and the laboratory support is needed to make a diagnosis. Again, and because we rely on coulters a lot, we know that if there is agglutination of RBCs, um, because of suppose it's a cold agglutinin disease, you know that autoimmune hemolytic anemia also have macrocytosis, in, uh, have um, macrocytes and spherocytes in uh, blood. So sometimes the MCV can be falsely high because you are, they are clumped together and they are counted as the MCV is counted as higher. Even hyperglycemia and leukocytosis sometimes leads to a falsely high MCV. So all these findings that you are seeing on your automated coulters must be confirmed on a peripheral smear. So, um, okay, before we move to the peripheral smear, just to recap, what is anemia? We know the WHO definition is what we all follow. So uh, you have cutoffs for uh, six months to um, uh, uh, five years, that is 59 months, and you have five to 11 years and 12 to 14. So these... Uh, cutoffs you need to know. So anything which is less than 11 in an under five child or less than 11.5 in a child aged from five to 11 years or less than 12 in older children, you need to label them as anemia. Look at the MCD, you have age specific uh, formula. So if the child is aged two to 10 years, 84 plus your 0.6 into age becomes your uh, cutoff for MCD. So anything more than that, would be labeled as macrocytosis. And in older children, any MCV which is more than 90 is labeled as macrocytosis. So uh, here is a, a CBC report that you typically uh, see on the Coulter reports. And uh, you can see here that this is a 11-year-old girl. So we know that she's anemic if her HB is uh, less than, you just read, it's less than 12. So um, your, her hemoglobin is 8.7, she's anemic. 
And if you look at the MCV, it is 96.2. So we know that 90 is the cutoff. So she has macrocytosis, she's anemic. And then you look at the other parameters. So she also has leukopenia, she also has thrombocytopenia, and she also has a low RBC count. So it suggests that RBCs are not being synthesized in the body. So based on this uh, report, you should suspect uh, underlying uh, nutritional deficiency of B12 or folic acid, but you should also keep a differential of aplastic anemia in mind because sometimes uh, aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, and even uh, leukemia uh, can mimic this kind of, can have this kind of a CBC. So it is very important to look at the other things also. So what is the other thing that is important? The RDW is important. Here you can see that the RDW is increased, which indicates there is an isopoikilocytosis. Again, that points towards your nutritional etiology. So peripheral smear is something we rely on to distinguish a uh, lot of these conditions. So you look at the peripheral smear and you look specifically for presence of ovalocytes, which are similar to your macrocytes. They are oval in shape. Then you look for hypersegmented neutrophils. You look for Howell Jolly bodies and Cabot rings. Now, uh, hypersegmented neutrophils um, are when your uh, neutrophils have more than five lobes, five or more lobes, and more than 5% of such neutrophils are there in the peripheral smear. We say that there is presence of hypersegmented neutrophils. Now, looking at the peripheral smear will help you exclude MDS, where you will find hypogranular and hypolobated neutrophils. In liver disease, you do not find so much of an isocytosis. You find presence of target cells, round macrocytes, and stomatocytes. In hemolytic anemias, again, target cells are very, very uh, commonly seen. You see in NRBCs, you can see reticulocytosis. So by looking at the peripheral smear, you can exclude the other differentials. A pitfall of this uh, PS is that if you are not finding hypersegmented neutrophils, it does not always mean that the patient does not have megaloblastic anemia because of B12 deficiency. But if you find it, it is always helpful to make your diagnosis. Now, because of this nutri nutri nutritional deficiency, obviously the food is not there, the RBC won't be synthesized. So the reticular site count would be low, unlike in hemolysis, where in response to hemolysis, there is a rapid increase in your reticulocyte count. Now, a reticulocyte count is also seen sometimes as a um, response to treatment. So sometimes if you can, you don't have facilities for testing your levels. And what we can do is we give a therapeutic challenge with B12 and we see the response. So the a rise in reticulocyte count can sometimes indicate that there is an underlying deficiency. So it is also used as a diagnostic test sometimes when you are seeing the response to B12 uh, therapy. However, again, this has a pitfall that this may be blunted if there is a coexisting iron deficiency. You may not get such a good retic response. Now, this is how a peripheral smear would appear for a nutritional B12 deficiency. You would see the presence of these macro valocytes. These are hypersegmented neutrophils. You can have teardrop cells. And these are Howell Jolly, Jolly bodies. So these are DNA inclusions which you can find in the RBCs. And Howell Jolly, Jolly bodies are not specific for uh, megaloblastic anemia. You can also find these in um, splenectomized patients. In this particular PS, I'm not seeing any platelet. So there is associated thrombocytopenia. Again, another feature which your pathologist may be able to tell you is the presence of cabot rings. We may not be able to appreciate this in the peripheral smear. Frankly, I have not been able to appreciate myself, but when the pathologist shows me, yes, I can say, yeah, this is a cabot ring. So what is it? It is a red-violet stain microtubule, which is arranged in a signet ring or a figure of eight kind of appearance in the RBCs. And again, because of the impaired DNA synthesis, there is a impairment in the mitotic spindles, and these remnants can be seen in the peripheral smear. Now, uh, again, uh, this is another CBC from a patient, and you can see that there is a very large size of the RBCs. The MCV is 117. The RDW is again increased to 24.4%. 
but the WBC count here is normal and the platelet count is also normal. So sometimes you may not find, uh, you, it is only sometimes that you will get leukopenia and platelet to be low. In most of the cases, these would be normal. So an approach, a broad approach based on your basic test. So um, if you have macros, how to proceed further. So if you have macrocytic anemia, it is important to also confirm the same by using B12 and folic acid levels. And where both are low, you can say that there is folic acid deficiency. Then you will try to ascertain the cause. If B12 is low and folic acid is normal, then you say B12 deficiency. If there is folate deficiency and B12 is normal, then again, you try to ascertain the causes. However, if you find that both the conditions are normal, both the levels are normal, and there is reticulocytosis, then you should think of hemolysis or acute blood loss. And if there is reticulocytopenia or there is no reticulocyte count that is raised, that it could be normal or uh, decrease, then you have to think of other causes like MDS, you could have aplastic anemia, you can have hypothyroidism and liver disease. So this is just a broad overview to help you proceed with the diagnosis. Now, um, bone marrow aspiration is needed where, um, only if you are having atypical features. So uh, if your patient is having severe pancytopenia and you are worried that you could be missing aplastic anemia or your patient is having uh, features of hepatosplenomegaly, which may be because of underlying leukemia, or lymphadenopathy, and you find that uh, it could be a poor response to therapy, then you have to think of certain alternative diagnosis. In those cases, it is important to do a bone marrow aspiration. And um, you here you see a slide, uh, a photo of your bone marrow aspirate slide. And what you see here is the presence of these large giant uh, stab cells. So the, even the uh, synthesis of your neutrophils gets uh, disrupted. And apart from finding these megaloblasts, you also find these stab cells in your bone marrow. So unlike in aplastic anemia, which is hypocellular, in um, B12 deficiency, there's going to be a hypercellular marrow. And these giant metamylocytes and megaloblastic erythr uh, erythroblasts is what you will see. Uh, sir, I would uh, like to, I have animations in a lot of slides, so I am not able to show these animations on this. Dr. Ajay? You can shift to the old method of uh, uh, displaying slides. Okay. So, is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. What is happening? Okay. So, coming to a test which we spoke of before, that is your B12 levels and the folic acid levels. So wherever possible, you before starting treatment, you should take a sample for your uh, B12 assay, which we say is cobalamin assay. And based on several uh, studies, uh, the WHO has proposed a cutoff of less than 203 nanogram per liter as suggestive of B12 deficiency. So uh, based on this alone, it is not important to make a diagnosis. You must have clinical pointers and uh, presence of macrocytosis which will help you confirm the uh, B12 deficiency as a cause unless you have normal uh, RBCs with normal MCV 
but have neurological symptoms. Now the uh, uh, pitfalls of this test are that it is not a very good, uh, not a very sensitive test. As I told you that even in neurological manifestations uh, like MCV is not a good pointer. Sometimes even cobalamin can be normal in patients with hematological uh, presentation. Moreover, this is a very labile test. So suppose I take a B12 dose in the morning and come, so the levels will come out to be high and I take a diet which is rich in B12, then again, this will fluctuate. So it's not a very good test. And we must remember that all such tests that are being done should be done in fasting state. Again, it can be falsely high in conditions associated with inflammation and malignancies. And it can, it can be falsely low if there is a coexisting folic acid deficiency. It can be low because of pregnancy and certain drugs. So if you have a history of drug intake, and you also find an underlying folate deficiency, then in those cases, uh, you have to remember that why you are getting a, a low B12 and you have to look at that in that perspective. So uh, to conclude from this, uh, present, uh, from this slide is that C, uh, cobalamin levels should only be used as a confirmatory test or to substantiate your diagnosis, but it, the presence of normal levels can never exclude uh, the underlying B12 deficiency as a cause. So it is a supportive test and not always a confirmatory test. And it should not be used as a sole criterion to determine deficiency. So everything, your PS, your CBC should always be done. And alongside, you should do cobalamin assay to confirm your diagnosis. And sometimes if you're getting a normal level, even the, and you have clinical findings which are suggestive of B12 deficiency, then you need to treat and you can't just wait because your cobalamin levels are normal. Another important surrogate uh, test which we use is uh, serum homocysteine level. So we saw in the initial slides why homocysteine gets higher in patients with B12 deficiency. And a cutoff of 15 micromoles per liter has been suggested by the British Society of Hematology as a surrogate marker of underlying B12 or folic acid deficiency. So again, this is not specific for B12. It can be raised even because of underlying folate deficiency. The advantage of this test is, again, it's a functional test. So um, it is showing the activity of your B12 in the body. The test is easily available in the form of an ELISA-based or HPLC-based uh, assay. It is a sensitive test. It Sometimes uh, it, you are able to pick up high homocysteine levels even before your cobalamin uh, gets low. So it helps you in early diagnosis. And like cobalamin uh, challenge we discussed, even homocysteine uh, fall can be used as a therapeutic response to confirm your underlying deficiency. Some pitfalls are that I told you that it is also uh, raised in folic acid deficiency, so it cannot distinguish the two. It can also be uh, increased if there is an underlying B6 deficiency. The sampling for this test is uh, very precarious, so the sample needs to be collected on ice and separ separated before any hemolysis occurs and that it is affected by renal function. So uh, if there is a derangement of your KFT, then again, this uh, test can be unreliable. MMA is another functional assay that, that is your serum methyl malonic acid. If it is raised more than 750 nanomoles per liter, in the presence of normal renal function, it would suggest B12 deficiency. And unlike uh, cobalamin, this is not something that gets affected by diet. So this is an advantage of this test. Again, um, again, all these tests should be used like supportive tests. The Again, like homocysteine, this test has certain difficulties in analysis, although homocysteine, the assay is relatively easy because it is ELISA-based. Here it is by gas chromatography um, and spectrometry, so which is not available in all labs. So getting the test done can sometimes be a challenge. And uh, it is also affected by renal function. So uh, some people prefer to use urinary MMA instead of uh, serum MMA because that is uh, will be adjusted according to your renal function. However, we do not have any cutoffs yet to define B12 deficiency based on urinary MMA levels. 
So uh, we don't have any level to below which we will say that if they are more than these levels, it would suggest B12 deficiency. So for now, we only have a cutoff of MMA for diagnosing B12 deficiency. Holo TC, that is your holo transcobalamin assay, is emerging as a very important test because uh, it is the active form of B12. Again, it's a functional assay. Like homocysteine, it's an early marker of uh, B12 deficiency. It is useful more in pregnant women because the levels do not vary with trimester. And compared to uh, serum cobalamin, uh, there is a much higher performance of holo TC as judged by your area under receiver operating characteristic curves. The problems is again, the availability of the test, the costly test, and that uh, references are yet to be standardized, although we do have a suggestive value to suggest your deficiency. And uh, like cobalamin, holo TC, which is your circulating form of B12, can be affected by any recent intake. So here is a meta-analysis which compared the performance of the three tests, that is your homocysteine levels, MMA, and cobalamin levels. And compared to cobalamin, homocysteine was a more sensitive test, and MMA was a more specific test. But we do know that we go in for MMA and homocysteine only in cases where cobalamin is um, not coming uh, supportive to your diagnosis. So if it is coming as normal or raised and you're still suspecting a deficiency of B12, then only you go in for these tests. Otherwise, in routine, the tests are not being used or recommended. Coming to folate levels, uh, you have to uh, folate, folate levels which can be measured in serum or in the RBC. And again, they have certain pitfalls. We know that levels less than 4 nanogram per ml in the serum are suggestive of folate deficiency. But this is again a poorly sensitive test, affected by diet, subject to dynal variation. Like homocysteine, it is a temperature sensitive test. Sometimes if your sampling is not done properly and there is hemolysis, then the RBC folate comes in the serum and you can get a very high serum folate levels because of hemolysis. And we know that co uh, cobalamin deficiency can itself lead to raised serum folate levels. This is because when there is a impairment in your methionine synthesis because of um, uh, cobalamin deficiency, there is an accu accumulation of tetra methyl tetrahydrofolate monoglutamate in the RBCs that gets diffused into the uh, blood and you get a high, falsely high serum folate. Red cell folate cutoff of less than 100 nanogram per ml has been suggested. And compared to serum folate, it is indicative of a longer period of the folate status of the body. However, the assay is very, very cumbersome. Most labs will not be doing this test. It is not easily available. It is very costly. And um, I have not found, in fact, any lab where I could ever get red cell folate testing done easily. So we only managed to do it in a thesis in our uh, institute, but otherwise practically this test is not available in most laboratories. And there is a meta-analysis which compares serum folate and red folate, uh, red cell folate. And although um, red cell folate is considered to be uh, suggestive of a longer, uh, long-standing folate deficiency, but the conclusion was that serum folate was better than uh, red cell folate. It really didn't offer any advantage. And serum folate had a better correlation with homocysteine. And uh, the conclusion would be that in most cases, your so serum folate is preferred and there is no need to go in for a red cell folate. So based on the laboratory test, I, we would recommend that uh, laboratory response to cobalamin therapy is a good test to establish cobalamin deficiency as underlying cause. Serum cobalamin and serum folate assays alongside clinical examination have a role in management of suspected cases. Cobalamin and folate assay should be done simultaneously because you have seen that they have a close relationship in the metabolic processes. Again, the test should be done in fasting state. And in case you are finding a discrepancy in your laboratory tests and your clinical picture, in those cases, homocysteine and MMA, uh, MMA should be used to establish a diagnosis. 
because serum cobalamin alone can sometimes miss the diagnosis. However, if you find that homocysteine and MMA are normal and you have cobalamin levels which are normal or borderline, then no further testing is needed. So this is an overview that whenever you have measured your B12 and folic acid levels, if one or both are uh, deficient, you know which is the diagnose, uh, which is the deficient nutrient. If both are borderline or normal, then again, you can go in for an MMA or homocysteine. And based on that, if your MMA is increased, but homocysteine is also increased, you know that there is a B12 deficiency. If MMA is normal and the homocysteine is increased, you can have a folate deficiency. If MMA is normal and homocysteine is normal, then there are chances of underlying B12 and folic acid deficiency are less. So it's uh, excluded. But all this is just al algorithmic and gives you an approach. Your clinical acumen remains the most important test to establish a diagnosis. Because you have seen every laboratory test has a pitfall. So clinical acumen should be considered first. Now, once you have uh, a clinically suspected case of B12 or folic acid deficiency, you should start treatment. But do all subclinical cases require treatment? We'll come to that. In this part, we will also be covering how to treat. That is, what is the root, preferred route of administration? How much to give? Which compound to give? And what are the side effects? How long to treat? And how to assess the response and follow up your patient? So when do you start treatment? If you have a patient with subclinical deficiency of uh, B12, then what is required is only a dietary reinforcement. You need to counsel the patient to take a diet. If they are uh, vegetarians, then obviously they may require therapeutic supplementation in the form of at least the RDA being provided to them by a the, um, supplement. Otherwise, therapeutic doses in these cases are not required where there is a subclinical deficiency. But if you have clinical features which are suggested along with the dietary history and laboratory findings, then you don't have to waste any time and you have to start treatment with vitamin B12 and folic acid. Prior to that, you must get an assay of your serum, cobalamin and folic acid. And it is important to remember when you start therapy, B12 should be started before you start folic acid because if you institute them alongside, then sometimes the neurological features of vitamin B12 uh, deficiency can get precipitated. Because you're giving folic acid, the hematological response is going to be marked. So the, the uh, vitamin B12 may be diverted towards hematological uh, response and the neurological findings can get Worsen. So what we recommend is that initially for the first one or two weeks, you give B12 alone. And in the second week onwards, you can start your folic acid supplementation. If you have a child with dimorphic anemia, then iron supplementation alongside is also important. So uh, now uh, we also will talk of how much to give. So for that, this slide is very important. Now, uh, this is a study which was published in the blood journal by Carmel. And you can see that the uh, cobalamin absorption that is happening. So you, this is the dose. This is the uh, fraction which is absorbed in the absence of a malabsorption and the fraction that gets absorbed in the presence of an underlying malabsorption. So as you can see that these are not directly related. So if you're giving one microgram, around 50% is getting absorbed. But when you give 500 microgram, only 2% is getting absorbed. So there is no direct relationship. So as the dose is increasing, the proportion of drug that is getting absorbed is getting much lower. So even if you're giving 1,000 micrograms, it does not translate into 1,000 micrograms of B12 in your blood. Only 13 microgram is going to come in your blood. So this forms the basis of why sometimes um, we are giving high doses of oral uh, B12, but when we give parenteral doses, the doses are much lesser. So you see that 10 micrograms of injection of B12 translates into 9.7 microgram of cobalamin in the blood. So uh, this corresponds to 500 micrograms. So a patient who's been given 10 microgram by injection can do away with 500 microgram of oral B12 provided there is no malabsorption. So this slide is there to make you understand the basis of high dose of 
oral folic acid. Now, uh, just to go back to the basics. So we know that uh, you have uh, cobalamin, which enters the stomach, and this is the food bound. There is some amount of food bound cobalamin in the stomach. It gets dissociated and gets uh, by the hydrochloric acid. This food bound cobalamin gets dissociated. And as it moves down further into your uh, duodenum and jejunum, it is acted upon by proteases. The intrinsic factor now starts binding to this cobalamin. And when it reaches your ileum, this gets internalized. Further transport in the blood occurs in association with transcobalamin. So uh, this is the broad overview of the absorption process. And what um, you need to know is that apart from this mechanism, there is some amount of B12 absorption, which also occurs by passive diffusion. Now, uh, this is the uh, uh, basis of sometimes, you know, there are uh, there is emerging evidence for use of sublingual tablets and orally disintegrating uh, um, pharmacological preparations of B12. So these get absorbed in circulation by passive diffusion. So um, talking of the dose, coming back to the dose, we saw that the dose depends on the route of administration. It also depends on the age of the child. So uh, the routes of administration can be either parenteral, mostly intramuscular or deep subcutaneous, and sometimes intravenous. Now, parenteral is the conventional route, which is preferred by most uh, doctors because you are assured that whatever you are giving is getting into the body. So because of this reason, at least patients with Neurological manifestations, infants with uh, abnormal with a developmental delay or uh, who are at risk for developmental delay presenting with B12 deficiency, those with pancytopenia or severe thrombocytopenia, and those with malabsorption, you would prefer this route. But in patients with thrombocytopenia, you have to be careful because giving an IM or a subcutaneous injection will lead to formation of a hematoma. So in these cases, you may be giving intravenously. However, intravenous route is not preferred over intramuscular or deep subcutaneous because with IV route, it has been shown that the drug gets excreted very rapidly in urine and there is not enough time for the drug to get taken up by the liver and get stored. So IV route is preferred only in patients with uh, severe thrombocytopenia. Otherwise, deep IM route is what is given. Again, the doses can range from 25 to 100 microgram. And the doses can be given daily initially, can be given alternate day intermittent uses on a maintenance therapy. There is emerging evidence for use of oral route. And most doctors these days prefer to treat uh, with high dose oral B12 instead of giving injections because injections can be very cumbersome for the patient. And there has been... Um, scientific uh, evidence to prove that oral can be as good as intramuscular. Again, the doses can range from 100 to 1,000 to 1,500 and even 2,000 micrograms. Uh, 1,500 and 2,000 micrograms are being used more in adults. So here is a Cochrane review which was published on adult data and it showed that uh, oral dose or high dose oral B12 can have effect equal to that of intramuscular B12 in terms of normalizing your B12 with the added benefit of low cost. So it is an effective modality and it needs to be researched further because the evidence has been rated as low quality. Now, uh, uh, this is uh, a study in children by Caesar et al. Here they compared, it was not an RCT, it was a group comparison. Yeah, I'll share my screen uh, so that uh, this overhead can be removed. Okay. And please stop here. Can you see? Yes, sir. I think you just have to make it full screen. Can we go back? The next slide. I think the animation is not coming. Never mind. I'll just tell about this study. This was a group um, back slide, sir. The previous slide. Yeah. So this was a group st uh, comparative study in children where it was shown that 
high dose oral and parenteral formulations both were as effective in normalizing D12 levels. And this study also showed that hematological response can take longer than one month of therapy. So uh, what uh, this also forms the basis for duration of your uh, treatment. Next slide. There are certain newer routes of administration. So you have the sublingual route, which is gaining favor these days. And we have a few pediatric studies on the use of sublingual. So the earliest usage was in 2014 in a child with malabsorption. It is a case, a case report. And subsequently, they have been comparative studies on oral and parenteral, uh, oral means sublingual and parenteral therapy. And recently, we did a study which was published in Indian Pediatrics on the therapeutic use of B12 in uh, sublingual B12 in children. And again, our study also showed that the duration of therapy has to be longer than six weeks. So there is another preparation of intranasal uh, vitamin B12. Now, this is a little cumbersome to give. And um, so I uh, don't know how many people are using it, but it is a little difficult to administer in children. And there are transdermal patches also, but we don't have any clinical study yet. There is one trial which is registered and there are in vitro studies. So we do not recommend as of now the route of in, uh, intranasal and transdermal in children. The advantage of these routes, which has been suggested, is that they bypass the intrinsic factor for absorption. So as of now, these uh, routes are not recommended for treatment. Can we move? So how much to give? Uh, there are uh, no standardized uh, protocols for administration because you will find that different people have used different schedules, different doses. But there are only two studies which showed that you should have an age <coughs> sorry, or a weight-wise uh, dose of B12. So the study of Bahadir et al., which was published in JPCH in 2014, showed that there was an inverse relationship between B12 doses and the age of the child. And uh, there was a study which was published from Lady Harding by uh, Verma et al. where they used a, a weight-based dose of B12 of 30 microgram per kg per day. And it was found to be effective when used over one month. So how long to give? So uh, the various studies have shown that children with hematological manifestations should receive treatment for at least three months. And those with neurological manifestations should receive treatment for at least six months. Mm -hmm. However, certain conditions like um, inborn errors of metabolism, malabsorption, pernicious anemia, they may, or a vegan diet, these people may require lifelong B12 supplementation. The schedule, as I told you, is not standardized across studies. However, uh, our uh, we had uh, guidelines of nutritional anemia, which were published in Indian Pediatrics. And uh, based on that, we have, uh, and on the studies, we have recommended these schedules. When using the oral route, can, you can uh, use 500 or 1,000 th micrograms, um, which can be given for three months. 500 micrograms is preferred in uh, infants and 1000 microgram is preferred in older children. The schedule can be uh, daily for a week. Uh, sir, can you, uh, the chat is showing in the screen. Your chat is showing in the screen. So um, when we are using in children, the uh, schedule can be daily for a week. Then you can switch to alternate day for the next week shift to bi-weekly over the next week, then weekly. And subsequently, you can give it every 15 days for a month and then once a month. So this is how you can complete at least three months of duration of therapy. If you find that three months the patient still has anemia, you can continue your therapy and explore why the patient is not having a normalization by three months. So you may be missing out giving iron, you may, be, you may have to check your compliance and you may have to look for underlying malabsorption. When you use the parental route, the doses are much lesser, which I told you why. So you can start by giving 25 micro, micrograms of vitamin B12. And these can be given um, daily for the initial, uh, even up to seven days, you can give it daily and you can increase it to 100 microgram 
uh, or 50 micrograms in infants. Uh, subsequently, this can be made intermittent. And uh, what you can do is uh, you can give 1000 micrograms of parental <coughs> vitamin B12 later on as even a, a monthly injection. But a lot of people prefer to give uh, maintenance therapy with oral route and that is an acceptable uh, treatment. So initial te therapy can be parenteral and maintenance therapy can be with high dose oral B12. So these are the various pharmacological preparations available in market. Cyanocobalamin is the one which is cheapest. Then methylcobalamin is also a cheap and very, very commonly available preparation. Adenosylcobalamin, which is her activated form, is not easily available. Hydroxocobalamin, compared to the other uh, preparations, has a much higher circulating um, life. So in uh, if you have to give intermittent injections for maintenance, then hydroxocobalamin is preferred because this injection can be given two to three months instead of every month. So whenever you need, you have pernicious anemia or malabsorption or underlying inborn errors, you can give hydroxocobalamin. Can we move? Yeah. So these are the market preparations which are available. The, you have these injections with cofol, optineuron, trineurosol H for your injective injections. You can also have mycobalamin in the form. These are few brands which I've shown and uh, you can have these oral tablets. These are the orally disintegrating strips which are available, but obviously we do not recommend this as a uh, therapy, but this is what you will find. You have these nasal sprays and you have these sublingual tablets which are emerging as a promising route for treatment. So cyanocobalamin is the most commonly available synthetic form of uh, B12. However, it, get, it needs to get activated to methyl and adenosyl forms. And compared to cyanocobalamin, uh, hydroxo is better because it needs less frequent injections. So wherever you need to give injectable forms, you may switch to hydroxocobalamin. Uh, cyanocobalamin and methyl are cheap and easily available, suited for oral as well as parenteral treatment. And as I told you, hydroxocobalamin can be preferred for patients requiring lifelong therapy. So some, uh, can we go back, sir? Some precautions uh, that you need to take uh, back slides. Yeah. These uh, drugs should be taken empty stomach when given orally. The side effects include nausea, itching, chills, fever, hot flushes, nausea, dizziness. Sometimes allergic reactions can occur and very rarely even anaphylaxis has been reported with use. And this can happen both with injectable and oral forms. Hypokalemia is a problem with injectable forms and particularly in those with severe, man severe anemia and in uh, those who are malnourished. With parenteral route, we recommend that you need to give a test dose before you give the injection because it can be allergenic or lead to anaphylaxis. Hydrocortisone can be used as pre-medication and whenever you are giving parenteral B12 as an IV injection, which we said was only in severe conditions with severe thrombocytopenia, it needs to be given very slowly as an injection. Potassium levels should be monitored, particularly in those who are malnourished or severely anemic. Sometimes neurological symptoms can worsen in those receiving vitamin B12 uh, because of suddenly your neurotransmitters start getting formed in the body and you may notice that the neurological symptoms have actually worsened and you will find a lot of case reports on that. So the reason is that when you give the food for neurotransmitters and they are being formed, suddenly the neurological symptoms can worsen in the initial phases. So you need to watch for any worsening. Now, when we talk of infants with B12 deficiency, it is important to look at them in conjunction with their mothers. So the mother needs to be assessed for B12 levels as well. The baby needs to be assessed for development and both of them should be treated together. Sometimes if there are uh, features of ITS, you may have to use propanol, phenobarb or phenytoin for your tremors. And uh, during treatment, you need to monitor these children very, very closely for their development. Can we move, sir? Now, pernicious anemia is something we don't encounter frequently in children. It is an autoimmune condition associated with anti-intrinsic factor antibodies and anti-parietal antibodies. 
Achlorhydria can occur because of decreased parietal cells. And uh, it is a disorder which may be seen in adolescents who have coexisting uh, endocrine disturbances in the form of diabetes or hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, and vitiligo. So treatment, as I told you, initially can be in the form of daily injections, and later on you can switch to hydroxycobalamin injections. Can we move? Yeah. So if you have an anemia, which is because of folic acid deficiency, then oric, oral folic acid is given in a dose of 1 to 5 mg daily. The preparation which is available in the market in India is 5 mg, and it is it can be given for up to four months. In infants, the doses are lesser, and even 50 microgram per day may be sufficient. But sometimes it is very difficult to get these preparations. So what you can actually do is just make the tablet one fourth and give it in a, by dissolving it. We don't have really syrups of pure folic acid to give to the babies. So um, when, whenever there is a normal B12, but your patient has a uh, folic acid deficiency, at least the RDA of vitamin B12 needs to be provided alongside. And uh, always the treatment of folic acid should be started only when you have excluded underlying B12 deficiency. Folinic acid is an option which is used when you have drug-induced uh, megaloblastic anemia because of folate antagonists like methotrexate and in certain folate metabolism disorders. Now, when you follow up these patients, the response needs to be assessed uh, clinically on day seven in case of moderate or severe anemia and on day 14 in mild anemia or earlier if the patient worsens. So you, the, uh, the patient may give us well-being within 24 hours, glossitis will start improving. Neurological uh, signs take longer to improve, but the improvement may be noticed by the seventh day and is typically complete by three months. And sometimes uh, some deficits can persist even longer and uh, you may have some developmental delay which can persist very, very long. So it is may not, it's not always possible to get a 100% recovery, but if there is a worsening, always look for an alternative diagnosis. The retic response begins at 48 to 72 hours, is maximum by day six or seven. The MCV will fall by day 14 and normalize by six to eight weeks. And hypersegmenting neutrophils should dis disappear from circulation by day 14. So uh, we do not recommend using cobalamin or holo TC assay because we know that they get affected by any recent intake. So wherever you have a patient who's not responding adequately, you need to check the dose compliance, look for associated iron deficiency. You may have to switch to parenteral therapy if the patient is on oral therapy. You should look for underlying malabsorption and an alternative diagnosis in unresponsive cases. So the key messages are that uh, inadequate dietary intake of B12 and folic acid are the most common causes of megaloblastic anemia in children. B12 and folic acid deficiency anemia is characterized by macrocytosis, increased RDW, low reticulocyte count, elevated LDH, and raised indirect bilirubin. Elevated serum MMA and homocysteine are functional markers of cobalamin deficiency and can be used where your serum co cobalamin assay is normal, but there are clinical signs. Parenteral therapy is preferred in those with severe hematological manifestations, neurological complaints, underlying malabsorption, pernicious anemia, and metabolic disorders of B12. High-dose oral B12 is emerging as a good option, and uh, it should be given provided your compliance can be ensured. Treatment of folic acid should be initiated only after excluding a coexisting vitamin B12 deficiency. So these are few important uh, guidelines. So the, uh, the guidelines of Indian, uh, uh, okay, which was published in the Indian Academy of Pediatrics Journal, that is the Indian Pediatrics, came up in last year. And you can go through that. That is the only available uh, guidelines in children. We do have these guidelines, which were uh, published by the British Society of Hematology, but these are based on adult data. And there is this nice article uh, in blood, which you can go through. So thank you all for this session. Thank you, ma'am, for such a uh, elaborate uh, presentation on a very complex topic.
we have uh, dr jagdish chandra sir uh, who is director and dr anurag agarwal president ip delhi i request them to have some comments um so um good afternoon in fact it's still morning so good morning friends and uh, excellent session taken by dr pooja i listened to the last 20 25 slides a very common problem vehicle deficiency presenting as pancytopenia to our wards and uh, earlier there were no guidelines on management of b12 deficiency what to give how much to give how long to give so nowadays uh, these guidelines have come up which is good and which will help us in guiding treatment and having said that iip delhi is always there for you uh, whenever you have a problem any queries and i hope all the members who are uh, attending this program are uh, central iip members if not please become central iip members presently central iip is charging 10000 rupees uh, and it shall soon become uh, 11800 because of addition of 18% gst so if you are not central iip members please become members quickly If you want, Doctor Ajay or I can share the link, and it is just a. I have already link. shared the link in the group. Okay, that's great. So please become uh, any time uh, you will get a instruction from Central IIT that the fee is hiked to eighteen hundred. I mean, eleven thousand eight hundred. That is an addition of eighteen hundred rupees because of GST, which has to be paid to the government. And uh, sir, Doctor Ravi Chandra is the mentor for the program. That is there, I believe. And uh, sir has been a teacher of teachers, uh, excellent person. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Dishinder sir will have something to say. Dr. Dishinder sir, over to you. Sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anurag and uh, Dr. Ajay. Um, like uh, I think this was very very absorbing session uh, on megaloblastic anemia. Uh, in fact uh, mm, the best thing that probably in these uh, sessions is that we have ample time to discuss uh, the the uh, details uh, of the, the the problem so uh, in one hour one can go over the subject uh, in a very big way so and and uh, dr pooja divan is an authority on megaloblastic anemia with lot of work uh, being done at uh, um, at gtv hospital and uh, ucms so uh, with personal experience these things do uh, come up uh, uh, in a in a different way than you would just review and present so uh, just couple of things uh, uh, i think uh, during the treatment of uh, uh, megaloblastic anemia uh, like the neurological problems do occur and uh, what we observed uh, in our earliest work that we did on megaloblastic anemia thrombocytosis also was a problem in fact uh, uh, during the thesis which was dr vipul jain's thesis was the first work which we did on megaloblastic anemia and we lost one child because he came with a stroke with a platelet count of 13 lakhs so uh, this was the, the time when neuroimaging was a very uh, scarcely available and we couldn't we, the, the therapies were very uh, difficult to give and the child coming up with a stroke we could not save that child so thrombocytosis does occur and particularly if there had been thrombocytopenia these are the cases in which one should be vigilant about second is uh, the uh, occurrence of megaloblastic anemia in vegetarians versus non vegetarians if we read the western literature veg versus non veg would be uh, different in their uh, vitral levels but in india probably particularly poor uh, society the things are not that different uh there is uh, uh, data on that uh, like those who tick themselves as non veg they are the ones who probably might be consuming like they don't have any hesitation in taking non veg that is what is implied by that they there might be uh, just a bit of intake of non veg and you label it as non veg second is that the non veg is cooked in poor families in a liquid form unlike the western countries where there are no Uh, liquid preparations of the non-vegetarian. They would mostly consume the uh, solid uh, preparations of vegetarian, and the whole uh, food taken is uh, 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 non-veg. So in India, when you are planning or we are considering the occurrence of B12 deficiency, uh, I think uh, in non-veg and vegetarians, it, it could occur uh, in both of them with the with the equal prevalence, almost equal prevalence. So I think. 
uh, we can uh, look at the questions if there are any in the chat box thank you very much thank you sir for the addition that's something which is very very important so a lot of questions in the chat box dr dr puja for you yeah i'll uh, through them sir yeah you can answer them maybe uh, what to do when there is a neurological reaction to b12 how do you manage so uh, you will not stop the therapy symptomatic therapy has to be given so maybe you need to just see uh -huh. whether you are not giving uh, very high doses as we said the enteral even 25 to 100 micrograms is sufficient so there is no need to give 1000 micrograms and neurological side effects are known to occur when you start uh, b12 therapy and even seizures can occur so symptomatic therapy would be needed for that So, so the teacher has asked, therapy. what is the cause of hyperpigmented knuckles? Yeah, so I told that in the slide, but I'll repeat that. So, hyperpigmented knuckles occur because uh, there is a, a reduced glutathione in the body, which inhibits the conversion of tyrosine to melanin. So, this reduced glutathione occurs. The formation is related to B12. So, if there is B12 deficiency. the conversion of tyrosine to melanin gets increased which leads to hyperpigmentation how to collect homocysteine samples yeah, so homocysteine is a very temperature sensitive test so ideally you need to collect the sample in a plain vial on ice so uh, you need an ice carrier it needs to be transported immediately to the laboratory so what you can do is you have the vaccine carriers in the uh, the vaccine uh, you have thermal uh, insulation or ice packs so what you can do is collect the vial on the ice pack and transport to the lab ma'am uh, what is the exact cut off for diagnosing macrocytosis in the flow chart it is 100 from the flow but in chart, the text yeah i'll just uh, clarify that the uh, flow chart was adapted from an adult guideline so there they are using 100 femtoliters but in children as i told you the there is a formula which we gave you 84 plus 0.6 into your um, age of the child when you wait into age of the child when you have a child less than 10 years of age and after 10 years more than uh, 90 femtoliters is taken as macrocytosis and for that you can refer to the indian pediatrics guidelines which we published this hemersland uh, grasper syndrome that is an inborn error of metabolism of b12 deficiency i would request you all these are very complex things it's very difficult to cover each of them so if you have a suspected case please go to your book and get back to individual iims and you can even post the queries in the group or uh, we'll request dr puja diwan to answer if there are any yeah you can specific, any specific uh, yeah. case reports or something yeah you can I get in touch with dr puja uh, uh, dr ajay uh, ajay Uh, we do have an interesting question. question. Most iron preparations have folic acid. Should we rule out megaloblastic anemia before prescribing these medications, as there is risk of worsening neurological symptoms if there is underlying B12 deficiency? Definitely a very very important question and very very practical problem. So wherever you have any suspicion of underlying clinical suspicion of underlying associated or your peripheral smear is reporting a dimorphic picture. in that case you must get cobalamin levels done before starting uh, your preparation because in that case you may have to supplement b12 first and then add your folic acid so if you have dimorphic picture on the ps then you should get mm -hmm. it done but as a routine i will not recommend in all cases because iron deficiency anemia is more common than b12 deficiency but if you have clinical pointers or laboratory pointers to suggest Underlying B12 deficiency, then you should go ahead for cobalamin. Ma'am, why not add B12 always with iron yeah. deficiency when we have That's... a document? I mean, when we believe that it is nutritional iron deficiency, we should add B12 always with iron. That's why you know it becomes a cocktail. You add B12 also. You add uh, uh, vitamin C also. That is now not how science should work because you will be treating empirically everything, and later on you may not know what you have treated. you may get stuck because you don't know whether the response is to b12 or it is to iron so you should not presumptively treat where you have no underlying um, uh, pointers for the disease it can mask your make the diagnosis or if you later on have a dilemma you don't know why you 
what is the response due to? So that is not something which I will recommend without any evidence. So if you detect a B12 deficiency and treat with B12 and there is clinical improvement, is there a guideline to uh, retest after say one month or two months or something for B12 levels? There is no need to test with B12 levels because B12 mm -hmm. levels will fluctuate with your daily intake. So what you need to assess is a clinical response, the clinical retic intake, response, yeah. MCV and the presence of you no know, findings in your peripheral skin, but not cobalamin levels. Okay. Dr. Jigdish, sir, what's your example? Sir has raised his hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was regarding the uh, the use of uh, B12 uh, in addition to iron folate. Actually, uh, despite the B12 deficiency being quite prevalent in our country in different age groups to the tune of, say, 40-50%, there is a body of uh, literature in the country and there are some people who are trying to show that addition of B12 does not improve the uh, the anemia uh, in in these population these are all population studies in one study which was done near kirti nagar the dose used was i think 500 microgram in addition to whatever iron folate was given but there was hardly any difference in the hemoglobin at the end of eight weeks and after that one study was done near palwal in which they used higher dose because they thought the previous study used just a small dose so in that also, I think you, the use of 1,000 microgram or 1,500, there was not much difference. So it, at public health level, the addition of B12 is being criticized as a, uh, you know, uh, supplementation strategy in addition to B12. So B, uh, in addition to iron and folate. Right. Well, Dr. Salman has raised his hand. Please ask your question. Dr. Salman, you unmute yourself, Dr. Salman. Dr. Ankar, you want to ask something? Please uh, ask. Unmute yourself. Dr. Ankar. So by the time Ankar joins, there is a question uh, on infantile tremor syndrome with severe anemia. So uh, Dr. Sandeep Agarwal wants some input in the treatment of ITS with severe anemia. As he says that GMC Amritsar has a very high prevalence. So I think this was, must have been discussed. Yeah. ITS uh, is something we all encounter uh, even today, even in Delhi, yeah. we see cases. So in yeah, this case, yeah. I told you that both the mother and the baby should be worked up. Most of the times the mother is deficient, so you need to treat the mother alongside the baby. And uh, mm -hmm. the doses remain the same because there are neurological manifestations. You may want, want to treat with parental route initially and later on the maintenance can be done with oral route. And sometimes if the tremors are very, very marked and that is distressing for the mother and the baby, in those cases, you can give phenytoin or phenobarb or sometimes even uh, carbamazepine can be used for suppressing the tremors. Okay. Salman, are you there? Ma'am, isn't tremors in most of the cases are self-limiting? If you the, have... Yeah, they last 10 to 12 days. Yeah, true. That's true. For 7 to 10 days, they can last. But sometimes we have seen cases where they are persisting and even the uh, mother is unable to feed the baby because the baby has such marked tremors that it becomes a very distressing problem. In those cases, you may give this therapy only till the time the uh, you can taper it off over uh, a month. It's not necessary to give prolonged, but till some time you may have to give this as a add-on therapy, but it is not recommended in all cases. Only the tremors are very, very marked and distressing in those cases. So I have a question for Dr. Jagdish, sir. Sir, as you said that uh, B12 uh, supplementation, mass supplementation did not find, get very good effects. But there was a thought process earlier that when there is iron deficiency and you give iron supplementation, as the uh, production of RBGs increase, then there is unmasking of B12 and folic acid deficiency. So maybe B12 folic acid should be given together with iron. Maybe that has not been proven by the studies conducted on ground. Is that is that so? Yeah, actually, uh, you have very rightly said that when you give uh, uh, iron folate or micronutrient supplementation to improve the nutrition. So uh, it has been found that concomitant B12 deficiency has been a factor which has, uh, you know, led to poor response. And uh, so much so that in some studies, done in Himachal Pradesh, I think, there some b uh, B12 was also there in the macronutrient supplement which was given. But they found that because of the improved hemoglobin, 
the B12 deficiency prevalence increased uh, and yeah. the the reason they thought was that um, uh, the the B12 which was there in the micronutrient uh, mix that was not sufficient to take care of the hematopoiesis induced require increased requirement of B12 now similarly we have data from our own hospital kalavati saran hospital patients who were improving with hematinix uh, the uh, the hiv infected patients there the b12 deficiency increased the severe acute malnutrition cases there also the b12 deficiency increased the patients of celiac disease this was the work done about just about 2 3 years back the the b12 deficiency increased and this group which is uh, doing this work supplementation of b12 uh, along with the iron and folate and there is no response and they do believe that probably b12 deficiency does not have anything to do with the the development of anemia it probably it does uh, work as a coenzyme somewhere in the the pathway that is what that is how do they explain the uh, the non improvement of hemo, uh, the uh, hemoglobin status with addition of b12 uh, the puja there is a question how is the goat milk producing uh, folic acid deficiency is it because of it deficiency yeah that is because compared to cow's milk the content is much lesser folic acid in goat's milk so those who are predominantly goat milk fed are more prone to deficiency yeah that was a problem in rajasthan we had a lot of folic acid deficiency anemias and megaloblastic anemias because of consumption of goat milk in delhi we do not see this yeah, phenomenon we don't see this and should yeah. we give b12 and folic acid together as uh, most of the preparations they contain both See the recommendation is to start with B12 alone first and add folic acid later. So you do get separate preparations. There is no reason why you should only give the combination later on when you have to give maintenance. And if you have a preparation having both, you can do that. Sure, thank you. So most of the questions are answered, and uh, I think there's one more. How long phenytoin or carbam has been? Uh, so I, I already told you this is only as a uh, intervening uh, period because tremors sometimes take quite long and you may have them persisting even beyond a month. So what you need to do is counsel the mother. But if once your tremors are controlled and the patient is uh, reasonably uh, manageable, then you can omit these drugs. So many further questions will be answering in the group. Uh, so once again, we thank uh, all the faculty members, all the delegates for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Mga, Dr. V.P. Chandra, sir, Dr. Puja, Diwan, man, Dr. Vipul, and the office staff who is helping us with all this. And thank you, Dr. Lalan, for joining, Dr. Kamal, 